Hey guys, welcome to your lecture on muscles of the ab wall and lower limb. We'll start with um, muscles of the abdominal wall, specifically the anterior abdominal wall. And uh, when we say abdominal in anatomy, we're referring to this diamond shaped region right here on the surface, um, surface feature figure. Here's just the bony skeleton. And um, what we can see is the thoracic region has the rib cage, but the abdominal region, there's no rib cage around it, obviously. We have our um, lumbar vertebrae back there. We have it bordered superiorly by the costal cartilages. So roughly speaking, we have a, a region shaped like this. The xiphoid process there. Down here would be pubis, up here xiphoid process. And here, side to side, right there, it's like you have the bottom of the rib cage here and top of the hip bone uh, right there. So I'm kind of like going like this. I'm kind of like between here and here. It's like here and here in my body. I could palpate these things, and it's only like this big on the side. But on the front, it's much wider. It's like xiphoid process up here, my pubic bone way down there. It's, it's a much bigger region, or sorry, much bigger length from top to bottom here versus top to bottom there. So this diamond shaped region, um, basically like that. Because what we'll see is the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall are sheets of muscle and they comprise three layers. Anterior, Ab wall, short for abdominal muscles. There are sheets of muscles three layers. So in the middle, I mean you mostly have connective tissue. Um, they're connected here at this seam going right down the middle. Alba, linea alba, and um, you got the navel right there. And the linea alba is kind of like a, a seam where all the connective tissues, they kind of like zipper up all the layers of uh, muscle of ab wall. And that's really the only attachment structure I want you to know. They attach all around the rib cage, but pretty much just know the linea alba right down the middle. And on the sides there, um, notice as you strip away the layers, the outermost layer is the external oblique. The full name is external abdominal oblique, although I notice most books they leave that abdominal out and they just call it external oblique. Oblique because look at the direction the fibers are running on the sides there. They kind of, um, like if you're putting your fingers in your pockets, they kind of run obliquely down and in. Kind of like this. Kind of like that. So let the orientation of the fibers be your clue. And also the word external means it's the outermost layer of ab wall muscle. But if you re remove the external oblique, you have the internal oblique uh, deep to it. So they cut that layer off the outermost layer so you can see the internal oblique. And I'll draw just one more layer for the transversus abdominis. So this middle layer, the internal oblique, you know the fibers, they kind of like fan out. These ones go up, these ones kind of start to go horizontal, then the ones down here start to fan down. So they kind of like, like fan out like this.
Okay, so that's the internal oblique. Transverses abdominis, the deepest layer, they run straight across in the transverse plane, hence the name, transverses abdominis. Again, referring to fiber orientation. So it runs straight across. Don't worry about the innervation for um, ab wall. I usually don't teach that. But do know the action. Your abs, they basically, when they work together, they can kind of compress the viscera. They compress uh, this region. They also basically flex trunk, which is to bend forward, or as in doing a sit-up. So know that for the actions. Actions. Flex trunk. Press um, abdominal region. So this is the anterior abdominal wall. Um, notice that at the level of um, the internal oblique, the middle layer, there's also this rectus abdominis. So let me add that as a fourth muscle to know. And it's in the middle layer. And notice that the transversus abdominis also has a pocket for the rectus abdominis, your six pack. Well, there's actually more than six, but um, let me just write it on the wall here as part of the ab wall. Rectus abdominis. Commonly called your six pack if you can see it. <laughs> at the beach, caught in your six pack. Well, it's your only um, segmented muscle. The only segmented muscle of this region. So you can see there's these little inter-tendinous, inter, um, tendinous intersections is what they call them. These little pockets of um, muscle there. All right, so know your um, rectus abdominis as well. I'm gonna move on to the posterior abdominal wall. So again, looking at the, the skeleton, if you throw in muscles in the back, you can see there's some muscles back there. And um, the only posterior abdominal wall muscle I want you to know is the iliopsoas. So that's pronounced iliopsoas. The P is silent. People commonly mispronounce that iliopsis, but it's iliopsoas. Posterior ab wall. One muscle, iliopsoas. It's actually two muscles in one. So there's two muscles in here. One is the iliacus, the other one is the psoas major. There's psoas major right there. There's a psoas minor as well, but psoas major. Um, labeled on this side, and there's the iliacus muscle right there. So these two muscles converge to form one muscle, the iliopsoas. So be able to identify iliacus as well as psoas major. Two muscles that comprise iliopsoas. We say that this muscle is your major hip flexor. So if you go through the origins and insertions, um, well, you kind of have to consider both muscle for the origins, and then they both converge to insert right there. So let's go through that. For iliacus, the origin, is that's called the iliac fossa. For the psoas major, um, all, all, everything where I have highlighted in red, pretty much that goes all the way up to T12. I can see the 12th rib there. So T12 
all the way down to L5. Let, let's say that. T12 to L5 vertebra. So two origins to know. They both converge. And down here, they cross the hip joint. So you have to think about the, um, the joints of the lower extremity. Basically, hip, knee, ankle. This muscle crosses the hip joint so it can move the hip. That's the lesser trochanter where it inserts. They both insert on lesser trochanter. We say that this muscle is your major hip flexor. So I have an animation of that in the next slide. Now the muscle that's lining up this is the uh, rectus femoris, but um, it's demonstrating hip flexion, which is what I want you to know. There's a side view of hip flexion. So when you bring the hip up, that's hip flexion. Hip flexion. When you bring it back down, that's extension of the hip. So that's your major hip flexor. Br bring the hip up. Uh, I'm going to move on to the diaphragm. The diaphragm muscle, here's a um, cross-section through the body. You're, look, you're looking up into the diaphragm there. And what you can see is the diaphragm is your major muscle of inspiration because this central tendon, all the fibers insert onto it going in the circle. And when they all contract, they pull this dome-shaped muscle down. That's why when you take a breath in, your gut kind of sticks out a little bit because um, this muscle, when it contracts, it flattens and it pushes the, the ab viscera um, out a little bit when you take a breath in. Diaphragm. It's your major muscle of inspiration. about attachments for diaphragm, but do know that they all insert onto this central tendon. Fibers insert onto a central tendon. Okay, this is right here again. So do know the insertion so that when the muscle contracts, it flattens. Flattens during contraction. So the reason why this helps you breathe is when, when it flattens, um, you're increasing the thoracic volume that decreases the intrapulmonary pressure inside your lungs to help draw air into your lungs. Okay. So I'll write that out. Increase thoracic volume. Decrease intrapulmonary pressure. Intrapulmonary means lungs. Draw air into lungs. And we call that inspiration. Air goes into you. Inspiration. There are some holes there here. That one's for the aorta. That one's for the inferior vena cave. That's for the esophagus. You might learn that later. Uh, but anyways, it's a muscle we have to know here. Your major muscle of inspiration. There's a label picture you can study. I do want you to know the innervation of this muscle. Um, it's, a, it's the classic phrenic nerve. There are some breathing centers um, in your brainstem. That's why it's got nerve roots all the way up in your neck. C3, 4, 5 refer to the um, the spinal nerve roots, not the vertebra.
with innervation. On the spinal nerve roots, C3, 4, and 5, which form the phrenic nerve, because there's left and right on either side. They innervate the diaphragm. C3, C4, C5. Spinal nerve roots. Form the phrenic nerve. There's a very old saying in anatomy. C3, 4, 5, keep your diaphragm alive. Know that. Exclamation point. Get COVID-19, you have trouble breathing. So obviously you have pneumonia. We worry about that. Well, we'll, we'll talk, you can talk more about that when you talk about uh, the respiratory system in 431. I'm going to move on. Muscles of the gluteal region. So I'm getting down out of the trunk area, out of the ab area, uh, down to the um, lower extremity. So I'll go from proximal to distal. We're in the posterior aspect when you talk about the gluteal muscles. So this is all posterior views of the gluteal region going from superficial to deep. And pretty much here, I'm uh, featuring three muscles, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus. Now gluteus minimus is right here. It's the deepest one. You usually can't see it, okay? Anyways, highlighted is gluteus maximus there, big one, maximus. And so th th this muscle group, named for the region, gluteal region, and then the relative size, maximus versus gluteus uh, medius, highlighted in blue there, and then gluteus medius right there, the deepest one, okay? Let's talk about the gluteus maximus first. So there's the muscle isolated there. Uh, it's a big, broad muscle. And uh, the attachments are right here. The O for origins and the insertions down here. So the origins, everything highlighted in red, I want to call that sacrum coccyx as well as iliac bone. The origin, sacrum coccyx as well as iliac bone. Two insertions. That line right there is the gluteal tuberosity, and that right there is a connective tissue structure called the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial tract, you can't see it here, it's going to go all the way down past the knee um, to provide lateral knee support, so it inserts on there. So when you tense that IT, we call it IT band for short, it helps them provide lateral knee support because it goes all the way down past the knee. So two insertions, I for insertion, IT band, which is short for iliotibial tract, as well as gluteal tuberosity. So let's um, talk about the functions of this muscle, the actions. It can extend hip. So when the muscle lights up, that's glute max. It's extending the hip back, right? That's hip extension. Next, I believe I'm going to show you lateral rotation of the hip. So lateral rotate hip is when you move your whole lower leg out. You're moving at the hip joint. You rotate it out. So look when I faded here. See the head of the femur right there? How it 
rotates out, that's lateral rotation of the hip caused by the glute max. Once again, lateral rotation of the hip. I want you to know that. The opposite of that, turning your hip in, will be medial rotation. This one laterally rotates. Here's abduction of the hip. Move it away from the midline. Abduction. Right there. So this muscle can um, extend. Abduct. Laterally rotate hip. You can either say lateral rotation or internal rotation. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Lateral rotation or external rotation. I got that mixed up. So lateral or external rotation all, all at the hip. Extend, abduct, laterally rotate hip. That's the glute max. So let's do uh, gluteus medius next. Before I raise gluteus maximus, the gluteus maximus um, innervation is the inferior gluteal nerve. I'm going to write that on the board. I do want you to know it's innervation. Inferior gluteal nerve. Moving on, uh, gluteus medius there. You could see the origin, the insertion there. I'm just going to call that um, iliac bone. I'm going to call that greater trochanter. Make it easy. Origin insertion. So there's a posterior view of the gluteus medius. There's a lateral view of the gluteus medius. I wanted to show you a lateral view so you could see that the fibers actually fan out from posterior all the way to anterior. And because of that, uh, the actions of this muscle, because it has anterior fibers, the anterior fibers, um, well, first of all, let's say, if the whole muscle contracts, basically it can abduct hip and stabilize the pelvis while walking. So let me write that down. So the actions, if the whole muscle contracts, you have abduct hip, stabilized pelvis while walking. So abduct hip is again, um, looking at from the posterior view, if I bring my hip all the way out, look at my, I know it's hard to see my lower extremity, that's why I tried to do animations up here. But bring your hip out, and that's um, abduct hip. Stabilize hip while walking. When you walk, I'm walking across the room here, there's a, there's a part of um, your gait while you're walking, we call it the swing phase, where one foot's on the ground, the other foot's swinging forward. When you have one foot on the ground, your, your um, pelvis stays stable in a horizontal line. It doesn't tilt back and forth because when you walk, the gluteus medius on one side is contracting while the other foot is on the ground. So as I lift my left foot on the ground, the right small gluteal muscles, the gluteus medius and minimus, they're contracting to keep my pelvis stabilized so it doesn't sag as I walk. And um, so I do want you to know that stabilized hip. You basically use your gluteus maximus for running and climbing up the stairs 
You use your gluteus medius and minimus more for walking. Okay, so you should know that. Use glute max for running, or climbing stairs. Use gluteus medius. I'll just put glute med, glute med for walking. So running versus walking. Glute max is a more powerful hip extensor, which is kind of more what you do when you're climbing stairs or um, running. All right, so let me erase this bottom thing here because what I have here, um, for the anterior fibers, if you only use the anterior fibers there, you can actually flex hip, merely rotate hip. So again, flex hip is moving your hip up. Internal rotation is if you're turning your whole hip in. Okay, so imagine if you probably see my arm, if you turn your whole leg in like this, that's medial rotation at hip. Interior fibers. Flex hip, immediately rotate hip, so you could say medial rotation of the hip or internal rotation. So medially rotate, laterally rotate, internal rotation, external rotation at the hip joint because if you use the posterior fibers only you can extend the hip and laterally rotate the hip so this muscle can really do both depending on what you're using so posterior fibers can Extend hip, laterally rotate hip. Moving on from gluteus medius, there, there is gluteus minimus as well, but I'm pretty much going to test you on glute max and glute medius. I also want to teach you the tensor fascia lata. Okay. And again, before erasing this, I want to tell you the innervation of gluteus medius is the superior gluteal nerve. So gluteus medius innervated by superior gluteal nerve. The glute max was innervated by an inferior gluteal nerve. The gluteus medius innervated by the superior glute gluteal nerve. This next muscle, tensor fascia lata, well, what you see here is the entire uh, region being wrapped with them. Um, a fascia lata. A fascia lata is a connective tissue. It's kind of like your biological pantyhose or spandex to kind of like keep all your muscles bound tightly together. And fascia lata right there. So this muscle tenses a lot of fascia. It's a muscle right there. It's hard to see. It's inside the connective tissue. It originates on the anterior superior iliac spine. It inserts also on the IT band right there. You can see the glute max inserting on the IT band right there. The iliotibial tract runs all the way down to the knee, okay, for lateral uh, support. So, tensor fascia lata originates the ASIS. Let's remember that stands for anterior superior iliac spine, and it inserts on IT band. The action, tensor fascia lata, it tenses the fascia lata.
we just say it tenses a lot of fascia. Fascia is the, again, the biological pantyhose, right? So, um, well, it inserts on the IT band, so it helps uh, tense that as well. Now, um, this muscle is also innervated by, excuse me, the um, superior gluteal nerve. So, superior gluteal nerve innervates three muscles, the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and this one, the tensor fasciolata. So, let me write that on the board for you to know. Superior gluteal nerve innervates three muscles. One, gluteus medius. Number two, gluteus minimus. Number three, tensor fascia lata. All right, moving on. Because I'm talking about the superior, inferior gluteal nerves quite a bit, um, let's visit the, the sciatic foramina. Though those are created by those two ligaments I taught previously, sacrotuberous, sacrospinous ligaments. And um, what we see here is that these ligaments create spaces for nerves to kind of squeeze out the back. So this space in yellow is the greater sciatic foramen, and that blue one is the lesser sciatic foramen. So let's note the greater sciatic foramen. The space in yellow. Greater sciatic foramen in yellow. Notice this muscle right here that's exiting that space. That's the piriformis. So we can use that as a landmark. piriformis exits there and it leaves a little space above and below it for you to um, have nerves to exit. So um, the number one, number two, that little space above and below the piriformis creates spaces for most of your nerves to exit out the back. So here's all the nerves exiting from the trunk where you have your central nervous system to innervate the lower uh, gluteal region and the rest of the lower extremity and it's a, kind of busy to look at. Let's kind of focus on this picture here, where if you were to remove glute max, use the piriformis as a landmark. Here it is highlighted, there it is un unhighlighted basically, and uh, what you can see here and here, there are nerves that squeeze above it and below it. So here's piriformis. If you see, um, a nerve exiting above it. Usually the exit has a button. I'll just kind of draw three little circles to represent um, superior gluteal nerve artery and vein. They usually come as a bundle. You can kind of see them bundled up there and there. There and there. Superior Teal N A V bundle. Okay, but the nerve is what we're talking about because um, the nerve, superior gluteal nerve, innervates those three muscles the gluteus uh, medius, minimus, and the tensor fascia lata. I just wanted to give you a picture there. It's exiting superior to the uh, piriformis, hence the name, superior gluteal nerve. So this nerve bundle right there. I'll just draw three little circles to represent inferior gluteal nerve artery vein bundle. Not really concerned about the artery and vein, but they kind of come as a set. So uh, the, the inferior gluteal nerve exits inferior to the piriformis. That muscle innervates the gluteus maximus, as I said before. 
The other nerve we got to know, that's the sciatic nerve, which usually exits inferior to the piriformis. So you also have a big old sciatic nerve. The biggest nerve of your body is about the width of your thumb. So the sciatic nerve usually exits inferior to the piriformis in most cases. Sometimes it can kind of like um, split. It has two divisions, and sometimes those divisions split. One um, goes, it's, it's inferior, one goes right through piriformis. And very occasionally, and the two divisions split above and below. And we actually had um, a case of this, uh, one in the lab a long time ago, and um, what's well, long gone now, but uh, usually this is what you see. So here's a fully labeled picture of this region. Again, use piriformis as a landmark. Superior gluteal nerve artery and vein exit above. Inferior gluteal nerve artery and vein along the sciatic exit inferior to the piriformis. Um, if you have a compression of some of these nerves, particularly this one, the superior uh, gluteal nerve bundle, we have what's called um, small gluteal muscle weakness, which can cause pelvic sag. So no pelvic sag. Pelvic sag or um, Trendelen, Trendelenburg's gait. Trendelenburg's. It's caused from um, small gluteal muscle weakness. When people say small gluteal muscles, of the three, it's gluteus medius and minimus, or not the maximus. Because remember, those, those muscles are um, responsible for the pelvis stabilization during walking. So if one of them is weak, you can kind of get sag on one side. I'm going to call it small gluteal muscle weakness. So maybe on one side, the superior gluteal nerve is paralyzed. And a uh, nice picture over here. You can see the um, clinical description there, but let's kind of play the video. See if you can notice which side the sag is occurring. This side. Okay. So what you saw there is, um, well, let me just play it again. Just going to film you walk if that's okay. The weakness is on this side. No, no, it's good. The left side, but it's the right side that will sag. Yeah. Because this side cannot keep the other side stable. Okay, that's what I wanted you to notice. I think it's kind of funny that she puts the cane on this side, but it's the other side that's sagging. I guess patients are kind of funny like that. It feels weak on this side, but it's the other side that's kind of drooping down in the Trendelenburg's gait. Just gonna film you walk. All right, let's move on. We have questions for you.
Number one, in which orientation do the muscle fibers run of transversus abdominis in the horizontal plane, transversely? In one muscle, the posterior abdominal wall, that's the iliopsoas, its action is hip flexion. The actions of gluteus maximus, it can extend the hip, abduct hip, abduction of the hip, and laterally rotate hip. Gluteus medius, the whole muscle, can um, stabilize pelvis while walking and abduct the hip. If you use the anterior fibers, it can flex and mealy rotate hip. If you use the posterior fibers, those can extend and laterally rotate hip. Okay. The piriformis is used as a landmark for identifying those nerves. The superior gluteal nerve artery and vein exit superior to the muscle. The inferior gluteal nerve artery and vein, that bundle exits inferior to piriformis as well as the sciatic nerve exiting inferior to the piriformis in most cases. Pelvis sag it results from weakness of the small gluteal muscles like gluteus medius and minimus. If it's weak, say for example, on the left side while walking um, during the swing phase, it would tilt down this way. So pelvis sag is the pelvis is sagging like in Trendelenburg's gait because the small gluteal muscles cannot keep the pelvis stabilized. We're going to move on to more muscles of the, the, of the gluteal region. This muscle group right here, that's gluteus medius. These muscles from there to there can be memorized by this memory jogger right there, P gog Q. P G O G or GOG Q for piriformis, Jumella superior, obturator internus, Jumella inferior, quadratus femoris. External rotators of the hip. kind of known as the deep gluteal region. So in terms of action, you got it. They all laterally or externally rotate the hip out. Okay, they're going to pull on the head of the femur. They're just going to rotate it externally. Okay, and um, in terms of innervation, don't worry about innervation. As a group, they all receive direct branches from the sacral plexus, but that's usually something we don't hold you responsible for in a basic anatomy class. But PGOG Q can be um, a useful way just to remember, memorize the names going from superior to inferior, piriformis, Jumella superior, obturator internus, Jumellus inferior, quadratus femoris. The GOG, um, they're usually really closely associated with each other. Sometimes they're referred to as the triceps coxae. Because um, that refers to hip, and triceps, three heads. So the triceps coxae, um, know that and know each head. Okay. So Start with the piriformis, go through some details there. I have the piriformis, highlight it in green. Here I have the, um, the origins and the insertions. So the origin, right, I have to show you an anterior aspect of the pelvis region, because um, right there I highlight it in red. 
is the origin of the piriformis. I want to call that sacrum anterior aspect or its or origin. Which is over here, it inserts on the, dra uh, the greater trochanter of the femur. So imagine the piriformis attaching there, exiting the greater sciatic foramen, and inserting there on the greater trochanter. Here's the Gemella superior highlighted in green. Here its origins and insertions there. It originates right there. That is the ischial spine. It inserts on greater trochanter. Here's the um, obturator internus. Remember the obturator foreman right there? So it's originating there. And the tendon is reaching all the way there and inserting on greater trochanter again. So here's the O's and the I's, the origin insertion for obturator internus. Those are obturator externus, but I'm not teaching that one. greater trochanter because it also inserts there. It originates right here, kind of highlighted, obturator, uh, the obturator membrane. I want to give you one more picture of the obturator internus because the uh, tendon was in the way. Excuse me, um, uh, the sacrotuberous ligament was in the way. Here it is isolated, this big broad attachment on the obturator um, membrane and the tendon reaches across, exits and inserts on the greater trochanter there. Let's move on to the gemellus inferior. Highlight it in green again. Oh, I'm sorry, gemellus inferior. The origin right there, let's just call that the, the ischium, the ischial bone, and same insertion, greater trochanter. Here's the quadratus femoris, named for um, it being a four-sided muscle, named for its shape. Okay, so there's the origin and insertion. Um, I'm going to still call that the ischium for the most part. The insertion has kind of moved away from the greater trochanter a little bit. They kind of call this the crest of the intertrochanteric line. Okay. Crest of inter. intertrochanteric line. So think of a line connecting greater to lesser trochanter, so it's kind of like that crest of that line in between the two there. So that's the, sorry to get this right. <coughs> Originate ischium, insert crest of intertrochanteric line, that is the quadratus. Oh, 
the Morris. Okay, so I got it right there. We'll move on away from the gluteal region to the thigh region, which is the region between hip and knee. And um, here's an anterior aspect of the thigh, fully labeled and then unlabeled so you can study. I think to go through it with you guys, um, it helps to know the thigh compartments. There's the anterior, the medial, the posterior compartment. So what I did was, in the app, they just kind of like made a cut there and just kind of looked down. You can see the feet, so I'm looking down this is a cross-sectional view. So that's medial. That's, um, this is anterior, that's posterior. And those are the three compartments. Medial, anterior, posterior compartments of the thigh. Thigh can be divided into three regions. Medial, anterior, posterior. Thigh. And each region is innervated by a different nerve and the different muscles will do different actions. We'll do the medial thigh first. So what I did was, in the cross-sectional view, I highlighted three muscles. So you should be able to identify muscles in cross-section as well as like we normally view them anteriorly or posteriorly. And anyways, as a compartment, the medial compartment, they're pretty much all adductors of the thigh, adduction. So if your thigh is out, it can move it in, okay, in the frontal plane. The innervation for this region, exclusively obturator nerve, okay, So general things about the thigh, medial compartment, all the muscles are adductors. If there's a muscle that does something else, I'll let you know, but pretty much as a group, adductors. In fact, some of the muscles that we're doing are called adductors. But there's only three that we're going to cover. There's more. Adductor longus, magnus, and gracilis. There's also pectineus and adductor brevis. I'm not going to do those. Okay, so they're all adductors in this region. Um, the innervation is obturator nerve. So know the innervation for this region. You may be able to identify them in cross-section, these three muscles. Let's look at them one at a time. Here's the adductor longus muscle isolated. So you, you should be able to um, identify a muscle isolated as well as um, with all the other muscles as shown here. And so I kind of highlighted in, I'm sorry, in green, the adductor longus, uh, with all the other muscles isolated, no both. Adductor longus. Obviously, identification is something you're responsible for. The muscle is named for what it does. It adducts the thigh. Longus, um, there's a brevis, but again, we're not covering that. Just know the adductor longus. Be able to know its origins. It originates from, I'm going to call that basically pubic bone. It inserts, that's an anterior view. It inserts posteriorly, um, that's the linea aspera. Originates pubis, inserts linea aspera. Let's remember that's the shaft of the posterior femur bone. Again, the innervation, obturator nerve, the action is adduction at the hip or adduct thigh. Well, here's the big old adductor magnus muscle. You can see why it's adductor magnus, it's huge. And um, here it is isolated. There it is highlighted. 
Now what I had to do was, you, you can't really see it with all the muscles on there. So to get from this view to this view, I had to hide in the app, I, hi I had to hide the rectus femoris, I had to hide the sartorius, I had to hide vastus medialis, and I had to hide the adductor longus. I had to hide all of those muscles to see it there. So once again, I had to hide rectus femoris, sartorius, vastus medialis, adductor longus, just so you could see it, how deep it is in the thigh. Um, yeah, so be able to identify the adductor magnus in pictures like this. Another important point to note, this adductor magnus, there's a little hole right there called the adductor hiatus, and that hole is very important. That is how the artery um, gets to the back of the knee for protection. The major artery, the femoral artery, comes out the subinguinal space there, and it's anterior. But then it goes to the posterior aspect when it goes through that hole and goes to the back of the knee. You don't want a major artery going over the top of the knee because every time you fall, you risk rupturing a major artery. So it goes from front to back through that adductor hiatus, which is a part of this muscle. Okay, so let me put that as a side note for adductor magnus. I'll leave the O and I for attachments there. Femoral artery goes through, it's called the adductor hiatus, that hole right there. To um, posterior knee. Remember, we call the posterior knee the popliteal region. It becomes a popliteal artery. So the artery doesn't change, just the name. As you go from front to back, you go from femoral artery, you pass to the back of the knee, you just change the name to popliteal artery. I do want you to know that. It's an important landmark right there. We're just going over the uh, attachments. The O's and the I's. Well, the origin right there, highlight it in red. I'm going to call that ischial ramus and inferior ramus of pubis. Ischial ramus as well as inferior ramus of pubis. Okay, so those are the origins. Ischial ramus, inferior ramus of pubis. It inserts in two locations. All along here, it's inserting on the posterior femur, that's the linea aspera. And down there, that's the adductor tubercle. So know that. Inserts linea aspera, adductor tubercle. Moving on from adductor magnus to gracilis. Um, graceful, it's a very slender uh, muscle. That's why it's called gracilis, which means graceful, slender, slight. It's your innermost thigh muscle. It's not a very big, powerful muscle. A lot of times it's used for a tendon wrap, actually. Uh, but, you know, okay, there it is. Gracilis. Gracilis, your innermost thigh muscle. So basically I'm saying it's the most medial muscle of the medial thigh. Um, so there it is right there, highlighted with um, all the other muscles. This muscle actually does cross the knee. So it originates way up here. And again, I'm going to call that pubis. It's going to insert, it's going to cross the knee. 
sensory, I'm going to call that um, proximal tibia medial aspect. This muscle can do more than a duck tip. It can also immediately rotate hip and flex knee, which this video clip will show. Adduct, immediately rotate hip as well as flex knee. Let's take a look at that on the video. Whoops. So you can see the gracilis light up when the knee flexes. That's knee flexion right there. Bend the knee. We don't say that, we say flex knee. Moving on, questions for you.
GOGQ is an acronym for what? That's piriformis. Gemellus superior, obturator internus, gemellus inferior, quadratus femoris. The action of that muscle group, externally rotate thigh, or external rotation at the hip. Thigh, medial compartment muscles all do which action? Adduct thigh, or adduct hip. Which muscle of the medial thigh can flex the knee? That's the gracilis, but it can also medially rotate the knee. Generally, where do muscles of the medial thigh all originate from? Pretty much pubis, although the ductor magnus also originated from um, ischial ramus, as well as the inferior ramus of pubis. <laughs> Moving on. Thigh, anterior compartment. Have the muscles uh, highlighted there. The anterior thigh is five muscles, four quad muscles, and sartorius. And then so pretty much now we're talking about the front of the thigh. If you're a muscle on the front, you can flex the thigh, extend the knee. So for example, if you're sitting down now, if you were to stand up, that would be extension of the knee. So think about like just doing a front kick, like flex, extend. So again, flex hip, extend the knee, as in as doing a front kick. Anterior thigh, five muscles. Labeled there in cross section of view, one, two, three, four, five. The four in green are your four quadriceps femoris. Or quads, but that's a lay term. The full anatomy term is quadriceps, four heads, femoris. That's the thigh region. And the other muscle, the Taylor's muscle, sartorius. That's muscle number five. All muscles, um, well, pretty much, generally speaking, flex thigh extend knee as in doing a front kick. If it does anything else, I'll let you know. Flex thigh. Extend knee. As in doing a front kick. Innervation, femoral nerve, for this whole region there. Write that down. Femoral nerve, know that region, that innervation for that region. Well, let's go through it muscle by muscle, all five. Be able to identify the four heads of quadriceps femoris. This is the rectus femoris, which is part of those four quads. So for the um, pictures I have here for identification, be able to identify it isolated, as well as in the whole thigh right there. And um, I have the origin insertion right there. So um, the, the quads are all gonna insert on the tibial tuberosity via the um, patellar tendon or patellar ligament as we called it. So let me uh, go back. So here is the quadriceps tendon, there's the patella, there's the patellar ligament. So this is basically one big connective tissue. It's gonna insert, it's gonna cross the knee and insert on the tibial tuberosity. So this muscle originates anterior inferior iliac spine. Originates anterior inferior iliac spine. You already had to know the anterior superior iliac spine, but now you have to know the anterior inferior iliac spine because the rectus femoris originates from there. So because it originates on the hip bone, it crosses the hip joint, okay? Because it inserts on the tibial tuberosity past the knee, it can move the knee. So hip, knee. This muscle, by inserting on tibial tuberosity, You can both 
flex hip, extend knee. Flex hip or thigh, I say in the hip. Extend knee. Again, as in doing a front kick. More quads. This is the vastus, which means big. Vastus lateralis, which tells you, you know, this is lateral. That's medial. So the muscle highlighted there. There it is in isolation. Okay. Let's look at the um, attachments on the next slide. Here we see the attachments of the vastus lateralis. And as part of the anterior thigh, it, it originates anteriorly up here. That's the greater trochanter, but it's going to go to the posterior shaft of the femur. So I try to like put it like a dotted line feature because it goes from anterior to posterior for the origin. Use this. Fastest lateralis. It originates um, great, greater trochanter. Put A and T for anterior, then it's going to go to posterior shaft of femur. It's going to insert again tibial tuberosity. So, this muscle, look at where it origins. It doesn't cross the hip joint. Okay, but it does cross the knee, so this can only extend knee. It has no function on the hip. All right, the next um, quad muscle, vastus intermedius. What I had to do was I had to remove, hide the rectus femoris so you could see the vastus intermedius underneath it, deep to it. Here it is in isolation, vastus intermedius. Let's look at the attachments there. This muscle originates, I'm going to call that um, proximal half. Um, of the femur anterior aspect, proximal half of femur anterior aspect. But everything else is the same. It's going to insert on the tibial tuberosity, and because it only crosses the knee joint, it can only extend the knee. Next one, vastus medialis. Here it is, big honking muscle isolated. You can see it there with all the other muscles. So vastus medialis. There's the origin and the insertion. So I'm going to call that um, proximal half um, femur, more the medial aspect. Same insertion, same action. Proximal half femur, more the medial aspect, hence the name of the muscle. Insert the tibial tuberosity, extend the knee only, that's the quadriceps femoris. Then you have the sartorius, which is not a part of the quads. Sartorius is a long strap muscle. And the word root, sartor, means tailor. I call this the tailor's muscle. There it is isolated. There it is with the rest of the thigh muscles. Kind of goes obliquely from there to there. And so if you look at the origins and the insertions, it originates anterior superior iliac spine 
and it's going to insert um, medial aspect of the knee. Okay, so origin, the SIS, anterior superior iliac spine, it inserts, I'm going to call that proximal tibia medial aspect. Proximal tibia medial aspect, and basically, um, you know, there's a tendon there. Uh, I usually don't name tendons, but usually there's there's two you got to know. The Achilles tendon and the pes anserinus. This is pes anserinus. That, that tendon is actually a common tendon to three muscles. And I, I got a slide for that later on, but I just want to get in the notes now. Uh, this muscle inserts on this aspect of the tibia via the pes anserinus. So the pes anserinus is a tendon. It means goose foot. Describing the appearance of the tendon. If you kind of just look right there, it kind of does look like a goose foot. All right, this muscle, its actions, I'll think about the, the, the joints that it's crossing. It crosses the hip and the knee. It crosses that joint and that joint because it originates way up here and starts way down there. It's a big, long strap muscle. It's called the tailor's muscle. Because when a tailor sits down, it's like um, when you cross your legs, and you basically put your foot on your knee. I'll, I'll just do it kind of standing up. Hopefully you can see me. Put your foot on your knee. Because when you do that, you flex thigh, you flex leg, you laterally rotate thigh. So flex thigh, flex leg, laterally rotate thigh, put your foot on your knee. Flex thigh, flex leg, lottery rotate thigh. The reason why it's called the tailor's muscle is usually when the tailor does their patchwork, they cross their legs and um, they put their foot on their thigh and do their patchwork. As in putting your foot on the other knee. Like when you cross your legs. That's the action of that muscle. I also want you to know the sartorius. It's one of the borders of the femoral triangle. I think you should know the femoral triangle, the borders, and the contents. These are major structures coming out of the subingual space, femoral nerve artery, and vein. Okay, so. Side note, femoral triangle. So let's copy that picture. Here's a triangle. Okay, so the borders are inguinal ligament, sartorius, adductor longus. So that border is inguinal ligament. That border is sartorius. This medial border, that muscle there, that's the adductor longus. That's pectineus. Don't worry about it. That's the floor of the triangle there, the adductor longus there. So those are the borders. The contents from all nerve artery and vein, from lateral to medial, always. NAV, from lateral to medial, nerve artery and vein. Here's a picture of a couple of nerves. There's the femoral nerve I just mentioned. There's the obturator nerve innervating the medial thigh. So let's remember the femoral nerve, anterior thigh, obturator nerve, medial thigh. So here's a picture of the nerves. Okay, so here is um, the posterior compartment. This is basically 
your hamstrings. I got them all highlighted there. Um, so now we're talking about the back of the thigh. Thigh. Posterior compartment. Your hamstrings. Basically, if you're on the back, now you extend the thigh, flex, knee, okay? Extend the thigh, flex, knee. So that's like going like, kind of like that. Kind of like when you're running, extend and flex. Um, extend, thigh, flex, knee. Basically, that's what they do. Now the sciatic nerve is back there, but let's remember, the sciatic nerve has two divisions, the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve. Okay, so let me write that here. Imagine um, a landmark piriformis. Here's my landmark piriformis, which means pear shaped, by the way. And the big nerve coming out of it is the sciatic nerve, really, two divisions tibial and common fibular. when you see it in the piriformis, it's one nerve wrapped with a um, with connected tissue. It usually just wrapped together. Call the whole thing sciatic nerve with the two divisions inside there. The blue one would be the tibial nerve. green one that I drew would be the common fibular nerve. So this is lateral, that's medial. In your studies, if you ever see the word peroneal, know that peroneal equals fibular equals lateral. Please remember your fibula is your lateral leg bone. So know the sciatic nerve, know it's two divisions. Tibial, common fibular nerve. And that last thing I said, also know. Peroneal. That term equals, same thing as fibular. Same thing as lateral. Your lateral leg bone, the fibula. And here are the hamstrings back there. Biceps femoris, both heads, long head and short head, no one. And semi tendinosis, semi membranosis. The innervation will be mostly uh, the tibial nerve, okay? We'll go through it muscle by muscle so you get the idea here for all the hamstrings. Um, they're, they're called the hamstrings. There's a couple of reasons. One is butchers use the tendons of these muscles to hang chops, okay? Um, but also the term we use to hamstring your enemy back in ancient times when. Um, they would slash the tendons on the back of the knee because you could palpate the hamstring tendons and that would prevent your um, enemy from running away, kind of a gruesome thought. Uh, we still use the term hamstring to refer to these posterior thigh muscles. Let's start with the semitendinosis highlighted here. You can see the whole lower extremity, there it is highlighted, there it is isolated, and there are the attachments. So thigh posterior compartment, first hamstring muscle, semi-tendinosis. The name tells you what it is, half a tendon. If you look at the belly of the muscle, the tendon is about half its length, very long tendon. 
semi tendinosis. Okay. Half a tendon. The other half is muscle. Are, um, these all pretty much originate, um, we're going to call that the ischial tuberosity. Okay. It's going to insert right here. I'm going to call that proximal tibia medial aspect. Think about the actions here. What joint is it going to cross? Two, hip and the knee. So this muscle can extend the hip, flex the knee. Once again, I have to bring my hip back and then flex the knee. That's what this muscle does. It's on the back. So now we've talked about three muscles that insert medial uh, proximal tibia. And um, there's three muscles here that insert via the, the pes anterior venous tendon. And uh, I, I want you to know there's a little sergeant foot as a memory jogger. Um, I'm trying to show you with this slide. Are the three muscles that insert on the um, medial aspect of tibia via the pes anterior And they are the sartorius, um, the I'm sorry, let's go from sem semitendinosis for S, gracilis for, oh, let's see, what is, what is the acronym here? Hold on, let, let me think for a second. Ah, uh, yeah, sartorius for S, gracilis for G, semi-tendinosis for T, the T for tendinosis, okay? Three muscles insert via the pes anterior tendon. They are the sartorius, Bacillus, the semi T, tendinosis. And I think that's cool because you got a muscle from each compartment, anterior, medial, posterior, and they're innervated by three uh, different nerves femoral, obturator, tibial nerve. So, what I'll do is the sergeant is SGT. Maybe I'll use a different color. G T for sergeant foot F O T Femoral nerve obturator nerve tibial nerve A cool little anatomy fact there. They use one tendon, different nerves but they're all from different compartments of the thigh that we talked about today. All right, so I want to move on from the semi-tendinosis to the semi-membranosis. Kind of like halfway flat like a membrane 
it's flat because it's deep to the semi tendinosus. Okay, so what I did was I highlighted the semi membranosus in green, and there it is isolated, but it's it's deep to the semi tendinosus muscle, and you should note that. It's flat like a membrane, hence the name. Deep to semi tendinosus. Has the same origin, ischiotuberosity. Inserts right there. I would call that um, the medial tibial condyle posterior aspect. So medial condyle, that's tibia, posterior aspect. So again, think about the joints that it's crossing with these attachments, crosses two joints hip, knee, extend, hip, flex, knee. That's what it does. Extend, hip, flex, knee. So both the semi, semi-membranosis, semi-tendinosis, they're innervated by tibial nerve. Tibial division of the sciatic nerve, to be exact, but anyways. Uh, moving on. The biceps femoris, the long head. Biceps femoris long head, you can see the identification pictures here, isolated with the rest of the muscles. Um, the big thing to remember here is the, the two semi membranosus and tendinosus muscles, they insert um, medially. The two, um, the biceps femoris muscles, they're going to insert laterally on the head of the fibula. That's the difference there. And you can feel those tendons on the back of your knee right there. So this is the same. The biceps femoris long head originates on ischial tuberosity. It inserts on fibular head. Remember, fibula means lateral. And so this muscle crosses two joints and it can extend hip, flex knee, and it's innervated by the tibial nerve. So that's all the same. If you remove the long head, you can see the short head right there. Here it is isolated. There's the attachments, so let's kind of look at this. The biceps more short head is kind of the exception muscle of the hamstrings. It can only flex the knee. We can kind of derive that because by looking at the attachments there. So it originates linea aspera, it inserts in the same place, fibular head. So because it goes from femur to, um, it basically only crosses the knee joint. That's why it flexes knee only. It can flex leg, flex the knee. It can't do anything else. Okay. Uh, innervation is also different. Common fibular nerve. That's why it's the exception muscle. All the other muscles can also um, extend the hip. This is the only muscle that can only flex knee. All the other hamstring muscles are innervated by tibial nerve. This one is innervated by a different one, uh, the common fibular nerve, the other division of the sciatic. Okay. So here's the back of the knee there. And with the skin on, you can even see the tendons 
right there and there, and it's labeled there for you. Number one and two are the tendons of the two semis, and number five there, they show you that the biceps and more is there. And so that, that depression in the knee is called the popliteal region, where you have the popliteal artery shown here. And the popliteal region, the sciatic, divides into its two divisions. Know that to be tibial. You know that one right there is the common fibular going to the lateral aspect of the leg. And there's the popliteal artery and vein there in that space. Here are some questions for you.
which muscle of the anterior thigh can flex hip and extend knee, as in kicking, rectus femoris can only um, flex the hip. The other quads can't do it. Now sartorius, it can flex the hip, but it doesn't extend the knee, it flexes the knee. So watch out for that one. Number two, what are muscle of quadriceps femoris all insert? Tibial tuberosity. Number three, which bone do the quads use for leverage? I don't know if I directly said this. Can you think of it? Think of the patella. The patella is used for leverage, making it easier to extend that knee. Which hamstring muscle can only flex the knee? That's the biceps femoris short head. The innervation of that muscle is the common fibular nerve, right? That division of the sciatic nerve. Um, the biceps femoris, long and short, they both insert on the fibular head. Name two hamstring muscles named quote unquote semi, semi tendinosis, semi membranosis. Their actions, they can both um, flex knee, extend hip, and they both insert on the medial aspect of the proximal tibia. The two divisions of sciatic, common fibular nerve, tibial nerve. Let's move on down to the leg, which is the region between knee and ankle. If we look at a cross-sectional view, we can see tib fib tip fib right here, tip fib, tip fib, cut. They kind of color coded um, and highlighted some of the muscles that we're gonna do, or all the muscles we're gonna do. So think of the, um, the compartments of the leg as the anterior compartment, the lateral compartment, and the posterior compartment. There's no medial compartment because that's just all shin bone, if you feel down there. Yeah, it's on my shin bone medially. There's no muscles there to study. So. leg compartments. Anteriorly, anterior leg, there's one muscle we're doing right there. It's the tibialis anterior. But basically in this compartment, if you're on the front of the leg, you can dorsiflex invert foot. Dorsiflex invert. I'll show you animations of what that is. It's hard to see my feet down there. Um, anyways, that nerve is the deep fibular nerve. That's a branch of common fibular. Okay. So imagine common fibular coming down and it's going to branch into two. Oh, I'm sorry. The fibular nerve is common to two nerves. Remember, it's on the back of the knee there in the popliteal region. One branch is, is going to um, pretty much go to the, the lateral leg, and that's um, the superficial fibular nerve. Let's say this branch here. The other branch is going to actually going to go through, squeeze through the tip fib and go to the um, anterior leg, and, that, and that's the deep branch or the deep fibular nerve. So, common fibular has two branches, deep and superficial. Okay. So, the anterior leg, the muscles that dorsiflex and invert foot are innervated by the deep fibular nerve, what I say there. Okay. So know that. So the lateral leg, think fibula, your lateral, your lateral leg, muscles in that compartment can plantar flex and evert foot. So dorsiflex is like sticking your toes up in the air. Plantar flex is like pointing your toes down as in standing on your tippy toes. And so you can plantar flex in either foot and that's the superficial um, branch. Lateral compartment. I'll just say lateral leg, how about that? Plantar 
plantar plex, fevered foot, innervation, superficial, fibular nerve. In the posterior leg, big calf muscles. Those are your powerful plantar flexors, like when you're jumping and running. Plantar flex and the innervation, tibial nerve. Plantar flex. So we're talking about the ankle joint now. When you say plantar flex, dorsiflex, invert, evert, foot, I think of, I think of ankle. So plantar flex. Uh, innervation tibial nerve. All right. So I'm not doing all the leg muscles there, but just the ones highlighted there. We'll go through them one at a time. And there's an unlabeled cross-sectional view you could look at without the highlights. Um, so here's kind of a view of lateral, posterior, anterior compartments. And the arrows are pointing to the muscles you can see here. Fibularis longus right there. The gastrocnemius soleus is what we're uh, going to cover for posterior leg, but th these two arrows are just pointing to um, the two bellies, medial lateral belly of the gastrocnemius. can't really see soleus, it's kind of hidden deep. There, that uh, arrow is pointing to the tibialis anterior, which we'll do first. So here's the tibialis anterior highlighted with all the other leg muscles, anterior view. There it is isolated, and there are the attachments on the skeleton. Uh, and just giving you one muscle for the anterior leg. There's other ones there. Where I'm just trying to like make it simple there. Anterior leg, one muscle of no. Tibialis anterior. It's the major muscle of the anterior leg compartment. So because it's in the anterior compartment, the innervation is the deep branch of the common fibular nerve, and the origin there. I'm going to call that um, lateral tibial condyle, and then proximal half of the tibia, um, lateral aspect. So the origin. Lateral condyle. Tibia. It's going to go down to um, proximal shaft lateral aspect. Proximal half. Tibia. Lateral shaft. Let's phrase it like that, okay? It's going to insert all the way down here. It's going to cross the ankle joint. It's going to insert on the base of the first metatarsal. So this muscle can dorsiflex invert foot. Look at it here. about it as the action's going on there. Pointing toes up, you can see the muscle lights up, that's dorsiflex right there, dorsiflex. Point toes up is dorsiflexion of the ankle joint. Here's inversion of the foot, turning the foot in, that's inversion, right there, inversion. I'm going to give you a side view here. The joint that's moving there is the subtalar joint right there that's moving. The subtalar joint. So here's the other view of the inversion of the foot. Okay. So things about the ankle. We talked about this when we talked about the bones. Let's review it. 
ankle. To be specific, you have callocrural joint. That's basically the hinge joint that allows dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Subtellar joint. That that allows inversion, eversion of the foot. All right, moving on. Here is the, the fibula ever longus, and we're talking about the lateral leg here. So here it is by itself. Here it is um, with the rest of the muscles. Because it's at the lateral compartment, we know that the innervation is the superficial branch of the uh, common fibular nerve, and because um, this compartment, I also said, it can plantar flex, evert the foot. Let's look at the, um, let's get a rule here first. So what I said was, can plantar flex, evert the foot. In terms of plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, the general rule is, does the tendon pass posterior or anterior to the malleolus? In this case, it's the lateral malleolus. If it passes behind it, posteriorly, it can plantar flex, that muscle can. If any tendon passes in front of it, it can dorsiflex. Okay, so we just kind of know that rule. Here's the origin insertion of the fibularis longus. It originates way up here, fibular head. What I had to do in the app, I had to kind of like rotate the foot in a way that showed the muscle within the tendon crossing behind the malleolus, so it can plantar flex, but it goes all underneath the foot. It inserts the base of the first metatarsal again, but this is the plantar aspect. The plantar aspect is the bottom of the foot, the sole of your foot. Okay? The top of your foot would be the dorsal aspect of your foot, the top of the foot. This is the plantar aspect of the first metatarsal. I'll say base of first metatarsal. Sorry. Plantar aspect. sole in parentheses, the sole of your foot. You know the insertion there. You guys have the actions there. That's E version of the foot. Uh, the muscles lighting up and the foot everts. E version right there. It's movement of the subtalar joint. So there's the talus bone. So you can see that joint is moving there. So the foot rocks back and forth. So I wanted to show you the tendon lights up yellow during E version. E version. So plantar flex, evert the foot. I just showed you eversion of the foot in that picture there. Moving on to the um, last muscle group, the posterior thigh, the triceps sura, or the gastrocnemius soleus complex. So it's posterior leg, so we know it's the tibial nerve. That's the innervation. And we know this um, group can plantar flex. This is your big calf muscle. So the gastrocnemius, Soleus complex. Gastrocnemius has um, medial and lateral heads. Medial and lateral heads. Medial and lateral heads. And the heads are shaped like bellies. 
gastro belly. Gastrocnemius name because of the belly shaped heads that it has. Um, soleus, because if you remove gastroc, um, you can see the soleus looks like a fillet of sole, which is a fish. Name for what it looks like. So, anyways, one, two, three heads. Okay, hence triceps sur, which means calves. Which refers to the two heads of gastroc and soleus, so three heads and one. You can also call the whole thing the triceps sura, but be able to identify um, the gastrocnemius, the, both heads as well as the soleus there. And they're using this big tendon called the calcaneal tendon or Achilles tendon. Okay, so it's one of the other named tendons I would want you to know. So the triceps sura inserts onto the calcaneus. via the calcaneal tendon or Achilles tendon. There are the origins and the insertions for uh, the gastroc and soleus. So the origin gastroc. Notice that the gastroc, it originates just superior to the femoral condyles. The soleus originates on, uh, I'll say, proximal fibula posterior aspect and proximal tibia posterior aspect. So for soleus, let's just say proximal tip fib posterior aspect. But they all insert, like I said, the calcaneus, the heel bone. This is your most powerful plantar flexor, like when you're jumping. But I want to show you knee flexion. Because the gastroc originates superior to the knee, it can also flex knee. Show you that. There's knee flexion right there. So the gas, one of the, I have highlighted one of the bellies of the gastroc. It's flexing the knee. Okay. Gastroc can flex knee. Plantar flex. Soleus. Plantar flex only. Well, there's plantar flexion, as in standing on your tippy toes. more view of plantar flexion. All right. I wanted to give you one picture of the common fibular nerve, dividing into the superficial fibular nerve and then the deep fibular nerve. When we look at the front, uh, the anterior tibial, uh, anterior tibial artery and vein, which you don't gotta know, but the deep fibular nerve, you can see it in a groove by the tibialis anterior muscle right there. You have to kind of dissect the part, the muscle, so you can see it there. Some questions for you. The three compartments of the leg are the anterior leg, the lateral leg, posterior leg, and which nerve innervates each. The anterior leg is innervated by the deep fibular nerve, lateral leg, superficial uh, fibular nerve, the posterior leg, tibial nerve. The actions of the muscles of each compartment. If you're anterior, you can dorsiflex invert foot. If you're lateral, you can plantar flex either foot posterior, mainly plantar flex. All right, that's the end of your muscle lecture.